say the safest, I'm in 1 Samuel chapter 19. A pastor who was once one of the most educated, talented, and most charismatic people known, he showed all he knew about him about power and ambition. He was gifted in languages, preaching, and teaching. His alma mater is one of the finest seminaries in the world. His mentor was a widely recognized leader and his church was one of the most established churches in the city. The church grew from one worship service to multiple services, from medium-sized church to mega church, and from one ethnic group to a multi-ethnic groups. His staff was fiercely loyal, his board was typical cronies, and fellow pastors were very impressed with him. However, his huge success came at the expense of others. For every three years, there was a showdown in his church. An upheaval ensured, and a group left. No one was safe from his short temper, his long memory, and his bully pulpit. The years of unparalleled success made him less and less aware of his faults, weaknesses, limits, but the payback was furious. When staff members tried to intervene in a conflict, he asked the board to fire all of his staff or he would quit. When the board refused to fire them, he had nowhere to hang his head and hide his face, so he resigned and left. The minister had since drifted from church to church, moved from region to region, and jumped from ministry to ministry. The twin towers of power and ambition can be found in any group, institution, or corporation. However, it's been said the safest place is to be at the center of God's will. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask you to just be with everyone here, dear Lord, and let them know what your will is for them. And let us all be at the center of your will in everything we do. In your name I pray. Amen. One of the earliest lessons that David's life was that power is overstated. David lived in the king's house. And last week he was given the king's daughter for 200 Philistines. So he was married to the king's daughter and became the king's son-in-law. But he saw firsthand the corruption of power and he was not willing to fight tooth and nail for it. To pour heart and soul into it. Saul was not himself. Things were not pretty and the stakes were too high. You know, Saul was a madman now. He had an evil spirit in him that would go and come and go and come. So he was, became a madman at times. See, God's blessing were not in the place of politics of Saul, but in the person and the presence of David. Power can change lives and affect people. Power in the right hands can nurture a Churchill, but in the wrong hands they can become a Hitler. How do we decide? Why is it harder to get out than it is to get in? What is the downside to power? See, power can change lives. It can affect people. Power in the right hands can do good, can't it? But in the wrong hands, it can destroy somebody or all the people around them, can't it? Jonathan, okay, I'm going to read out of uh, chapter 19. Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father. Well, I can't get this to load. Keep getting too many commercials. <laughs> okay, never mind. 
Saul spoke well of David to Saul his father and said to him, Let not the king do wrong to his servant David. Now this is verse 4. I'm starting in verse 4. He took his life in his hands when he killed the Philistines. The Lord had won a great victory for all Israel, and you saw it and were glad. Why then would you do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason? Saul listened to Jonathan and took this oath. As surely as the Lord lives, David will not be put to death. So Jonathan called David and told him the whole conversation. He brought him to Saul, and David was with Saul as before. Once more war broke out, and David went out and fought the Philistines. He struck them with such force that they fled before him. But an evil spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he was sitting in his house with his spear in his hand. While David was playing the harp, Saul tried to pin him to the wall with his spear. You know, last week he done tried to do the same thing, didn't he? But David eluded him as Saul drove the spear into the wall. That night, David made good his escape. The man who had malice a man who was a malice brute and a big bully for his neighbor decided to sell his house and relocate from the area. In the meaning to the surprise of his neighbors, the neighbors persuaded him to stay, saying his sins will soon come to a head and he will pay in full for his misdeeds. Why not tarry a little longer and see what would happen next? The man replied, that's exactly why I'm moving. I'm afraid that his sins will come to a head through me. Saul declared open hunting season on David and placed a wanted tag on his head. The Philistines were no longer his enemies, were they? Saul dispatched his son Jonathan and all the servants, not some but all, to do the job and finish David off. However, Jonathan was not cut from his father's cloth. He looked out for his friend and his sister who was married to David. But Saul looked down on his own son and rounded up his own daughter. David did all he could to gain Saul's trust. But when that failed, he fled and escaped. Try as he did. David could not slow or stop the king's madness. He did not blame Jonathan for having such a father. The soldiers for serving such a boss or even Saul for issuing such an order. Saul was mad. He was crazy, wasn't he? Could you do the same thing if you was in David's position? Not many people could, could they? But see, David was not. Stan would have made him a bigger nut, wouldn't it? <laughs> the third attempt on his life was the bottom line. He believed in the goodness of heart, but he also believed in the ravages of sin, the depravity of man and the corruption of power. The madness of King Saul was in full swing. One minute he listened to his son, the next minute he listened to no one. One minute he thought David was an asset, another time he thought he was a liability. One minute he believed David would, could do no wrong to the king and ensuring he had no right to the king. The king couldn't decide if David was innocent or worthy to be killed, could he? If he wanted David fixed by his side or stuck to the wall, David was afraid to turn his head, rest his back, or close his eyes. You know, that's terrible, isn't it, to be that afraid of someone that they're going to kill you. The good news of David's conquest and the good side of David's character produced another bout of jealousy. Madness and violence. David's works were not just good, but very good. In Hebrew, 
It's translated as benefited you greatly. That's in the NIV. David was as trustworthy, impeccable, and faultless as a soldier could be. The king wanted him dead as much as the Philistines did. The Chinese say one can easily avoid spears in the open, but not arrows in the dark. When David's very best was not enough, it was time to leave and relocate. And not a minute too soon. When Jonathan's stirring speech wore off his father, Saul's raving jealousy broke out immediately. The two sides of Saul were well chronicled. When Jonathan was present, Saul was an angel. But when Jonathan left, Saul became a demon, didn't he? A madman. The army needed David for fighting, but Saul hated him for winning. He was in a lose-lose situation. And that would be a bad place to be under the king, wouldn't it? I mean, you kind of have to put yourself in David's place. What if somebody was constantly trying to kill you? And he was the Lord's anointed, this person was. So he was afraid, you know, David had enough on him that he knew he was the Lord's anointed. And, but he loved Saul. Even though Saul did not love him, he still loved Saul. And you know, that's how we have to be with our enemies, isn't it? We have to love our enemies. They may want to kill you. They may want to pursue you. Whatever. But you still have to love them. You have to pray for them. Because that's what our Bible says. We're supposed to love our enemies as ourselves, aren't we? And it's very hard. And that's why we have grace. You know, think of Jesus on the cross. What did his enemies do to him? And you know, he loved those people just the same as he loves us. He loved every one of them. On that cross where they beat him and everything. See, the day, army needed David for fighting, but Saul hated him. His winning struck a chord with Saul, but it was not music to his ears. David's music was not good therapy, but bitter medicine to Saul. Power is meaningless when more hurt than healing. See, Saul sent men to David's house to watch it and kill him in the morning. But Michael, David's wife, warned him. This is verse 11. If you don't run from your life tonight, tomorrow you'll be killed. So Michal let David down through the window and he fled and escaped. Then Michal took an idol and laid it on the bed, covering it with a garment and putting some goat's hair at the head. When Saul sent the men to capture David, Michal said, He is ill. Then Saul sent the men back to see David and told them, Bring him up to me in his bed so that I may kill him. But when the men entered, there was an idol in the bed, and at the head was some goat's hair. Saul said to Michal, Why did you deceive me like this and send my enemy away so that he escaped? Michal told him, He said to me, Let me get away. Why should I kill you? A big city lawyer went duck hunting in the countryside. He shot and dropped a bird, but it fell into a farmer's field on the other side of a fence. As a lawyer climbed over the fence, an elderly farmer drove up on his tractor and asked him what he was doing. The lawyer responded, I shot a duck and it fell in this field and now I'm going to retrieve it. The old farmer replied, this is my property and you're not coming over here. 
the indigent lawyer said, I am one of the best trial attorneys in the country. And if you don't let me get that duck, I'll sue you and take everything you own. The old farmer smiled and said, apparently you don't know how we settle disputes here. We settle small disagreements like this with a three-kick rule. The lawyer asked, what is the three-kick rule? The farmer replied, well, because this dispute occurs on my land, first I get to kick you three times, and then you kick me three times, and so back and forth until someone gives up. The attorney thought, quickly thought and proposed contest and decided that he could easily take this old man. He agreed to abide by the local custom. The old farmer slowly climbed down from the tractor and walked up to the attorney. His first kick planted the toe of his heavy steel toe work boot into the lawyer's groin and dropped him to his knees. The second kick to the midriff sent the lawyer's last meal gushing from his mouth. The lawyer was on all fours when the farmer's third kick to his rear end sent him face to face into a fresh pile of cow pie. The lawyer summoned every bit of his will and managed to get on his feet. Wiping his face with the arm of his jacket, he said, Okay, you old coot, now it's my turn. The, co the old farmer smiled and said, No, nah, I give up. You can have the duck. <laughs> An English proverb says, When elephants fight, it's the grass that suffers. The hardest thing for David to leave was not the glory and honor, but the love of friendship. David had to leave his wife, his best friend, his fellow soldiers behind. Hurting them was never on his mind. See, David could have stayed and fight, fought all these people, couldn't he? He could have fought the soldiers and the king because he had God on his side. God would have protected him because he was God's anointed. See, but Saul saw this, that he had, Saul realized he had lost the anointed and he saw it all over David and that's why he was so mad and wanted to kill him because he saw that he had the anointing that he did not have anymore. David had won many fights, but not this fight, because the hunter was the father of his best friend and the father of his own wife. It was a fight he could not win and must not win. Staying behind hurt more than it helped. His best friend could not confront his father for long, nor could his wife fool her father more than once. Choosing father or husband and birth father or best friend was not healthy options for him. The father-son, the father-daughter relationships were at a breaking point. The father called his, her daughter's husband an enemy to her face. The Philistines used to be Saul's enemy. But now David was public enemy number one. For David to win would make his friend and his wife followers and make a nation powerless. Seeing people fight or die for him was not his style. The people would not accept a killer king either. And all Israel and Judea that loved David, including the servants at the palace, would end up fearing him instead. Because sometimes with power, there's fear, aren't they? Because you're going to think, well, if he killed David, if David killed him, who's going to be next? See, power is meaningless when there's more hostility than honor. 
How many is that out now? Three. My rule? <laughs> mm hmm. If I have more than two out, we wait on them. <laughs> well, I used to go tell everybody my rules. And I've got out of it because I thought everybody knew my rules. Huh? Yeah, I need to go over them again, don't I? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, power is meaningless. Thank you, Daryl. When there's more hostility than honor. 18. When David had fled in May's escape, he went to Samuel at Ramah and told him all Saul had done to him. Then he and Samuel went to Naoth and stayed there. Word came to Saul, David is in Naoth at Ram, Ramah. So he sent men to capture him. But when they saw a group of prophets prophesying with Samuel standing there as their leader, the Spirit of God came upon Saul's men and they also prophesied. Saul was told about it and he sent more men and they prophesied too. Saul sent men a third time, and they prophesied. Finally, he himself left for Ramah and went to the great sister Masiku. And he asked, where are Samuel and David over in Namath at Ramah? He, they said, so Saul went there. But the Spirit of God came upon, even upon him, and he walked among long prophesying until he came to Nara he stripped off all of his robes and prophesied in Samuel's presence he lay that way all day and night this is why people say is Saul among the prophets see Saul couldn't let go of his hatred and hostility for David jealousy he set a trap after trap sent servant after servant and involved child after child trying to kill David. The word kill occurs eight times in, that ch in this chapter. The bloodthirsty king even went ahead to do the job himself. After three attempts by his men to find and kill David and Ramaphel, when the Spirit of God touched the men, they had no idea what they were doing, did they? What they were uttering and why they were there in the first place. The hostility of Saul was unabated. Saul wanted David dead in the city or outside the city by his men's, men's hands or by his own hands also. With or without God's approval. He did not listen to his men. He didn't listen to his daughter. He didn't even listen to his son. Who stated that their human efforts were repelled and counterproductive. From this moment on, Saul would go after David by himself. And he would continuously pursue David. He couldn't trust anyone but himself to do the job and wanted no one to have the satisfaction of killing David. His ruthlessness had reached the doors and heights of heaven. When he heard that David had taken refuge with Samuel, 
the prophet. Saul did not back off. He didn't wait for him to leave there. He breathed murder even in front of Samuel. And Samuel, you know, he was a prophet. He was Saul's prophet. He talked to Saul all the time. And Samuel loved Saul. He grieved. He cried when he found out that God took the anointing away from him. He did not care if Samuel, God, or his spirit was around. A seizure seized Saul and immobilized him, which deterred him from coming near to David. If Samuel was around, the spirit of God embarrassed Saul to no end. He stripped off all his clothes, did the chicken dance, and said the strangest things and sat naked all day long, as naked as Adam and Eve were in Genesis 2.25, before the fall. Fortunately for the king, there was no cameras, no cell phones, or it would have been quite a sight, wouldn't it? See, power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. Do not let power, ambition, or success get to your head. And you know, that's what happens to a lot of people, don't it? Use what God has given you to hum- be humble, modesty, and respectability. You do not have to bow yourself at the altar of power or sell yourself to the altar of ambition. Yes, it does. That's how it is. I think the see that's Satan's thing. That's how one of his biggest strongholds. That's how he gets you. He gets you to working all the time, making money. You just want to make more money, more money, more money. And then you, you don't have time for church. You don't have time for your family. All you can see is what you can buy. You want that bass boat. You want that big truck. Yes. 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 He had a spirit that had went into him. Oh, Gracie don't know my rule, does she? If she talks in class, she has to tell everybody what she's talking about. <laughs> huh? But see, that's what Satan wants you to do, doesn't it? He don't want you to be in church to get the word, to accept the word. He wants you out there in the world doing everything you can out in the world and not serving God. Because he wants everybody he can to go to hell with him. He does not want you to get the fruits of the Spirit to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, He wants you to worship Him. And if you do not worship Jesus Christ, who are you worshiping? Satan. If you do not have Him in your heart, who do you have in your heart? Satan. If you don't have Jesus in your heart, you're going to have Satan in there. And he's just going to be whispering stuff to you all the time. Yes. That's how he does. He, he wants the world to sound so good to us. And you know, Satan was telling Saul all this stuff about David, that David was after him. And you know, we don't never really know what all that spirit was telling Saul, do we? But it made him mad. It made him want to kill him. 
See, the only promise of Christ's power is in the Bible and its availability to the weak. The Lord says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And that's 2 Corinthians 12, 9, 10. Let's pray that that power is not an art, an acquired taste, or a way of life for any of us. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask you to touch everyone here, dear Lord, and just be with them tonight, dear Lord. And if they do not know you as their Savior, dear Lord, just I just ask them to accept you as their Savior, dear Lord, and just call out to you and ask you into their heart. In your name I pray. Amen.